Welcome back to another episode of the King's Pulse podcast presented by the King's Herald. My name is Brendan Nunez, and today we're continuing our off-season series, and we're finally on a Western Conference team. Uh, going in alphabetical order, there's a whole lot of Eastern Conference teams at the beginning, but we're finally in the West, um, Sacramento, same conference, and to cover the Dallas Mavericks and dive into the specifics of their off-season and preview next year, I have Lauren Gunn from co-host of the Gunshot podcast. How are you doing, Lauren? I'm good. I, I am honored to be representing the Mavs. So uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on and, and taking the time. Uh, usually how I like to start, and I know this is a very vague question, so take this mm -hmm. whatever direction you want and, and however long you need to, but can you kind of give us the spark notes of what last season looked like for Dallas? Finished fourth in the West, but mm -hmm. sort of what was the experience of last season like for the Mavericks? Yeah, so... Honest, in all honesty, it was kind of chaotic. I think a lot more chaotic than than many people might realize because if you, if you remember going into last season, they that was the very beginning of this new regime with Coach Kidd, the entire new coaching staff, even the new front office members. So there was new GM, like everything. So there was a lot of change that they were dealing with. And then on top of that, they're trying to go, go into last season, getting a good handle on the Porzingis and Luca situation. Um, and then quick... Side note, there really wasn't a whole lot to that. I, they liked each other. That's really all I'll say about that. But they wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. Everyone understood the system, was moving in the right direction, and was on board with the direction that the team and the organization was moving in. And it definitely seemed to look that way, and everybody seemed more happy with how things were. But um, you know, as the season went on, I think there were a stretch of a couple of stretches of games where Porzingis was unavailable. And as the trade deadline got closer and closer, it kind of seemed like, hey, if there is an opportunity to move forward from this situation, it might just be best for everyone involved. Porzingis didn't necessarily, he wasn't exact, or he wasn't by any means like walking around like, I want out, I want out. That was not it at all. Um, like from what I saw from him and, and even like my interactions with him, like he was very, he was always very positive and, and very like happy to be there. He just, it just didn't seem like a right, the right fit. Um, I think everybody knew that. And so as the time went on, it was like, okay, let's shift gears. We have this opportunity at the trade deadline. We're taking it. And at the time, wasn't too thrilled about it. But as time has gone on, it looks like it has been a decent move. We'll see how it, it all the way pans out. But um, And then as they kind of get closer and closer to the playoffs, Jalen Brunson, Spencer Dinwiddie, Luca, the three of them are playing and coexisting and seeming to play really well off of each other. Jalen Brunson takes a step forward and everybody else, again, is on board with the direction that Coach Kidd wants the team to go. The system, everyone's locked in on defense. For the most part, they had the same team, but just magically became a better defensive team, even a good defensive team last year. And that was very new for them. So I think they're going to try to build on that momentum going into this season with the um, intense defense and making that a big priority while introducing Christian Wood and and kind of adapting with these changes and, and trying to build on the momentum that they had last year. Yeah, it makes sense. A whole lot of change. I got to be honest, yeah. I was really shocked by Jason Kidd being so successful. I thought it was <laughs> yeah, a you and pretty <laughs> questionable hiring. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he did have a great track record coming in with Brooklyn and then Milwaukee. It did look great, um, but turned it around pretty quick. And for them to improve on the defensive end, like you pointed out in the way that they did, I think was, was shocking and maybe mm -hmm. gives me a little bit of hope that Sacramento can improve defensively with maybe a not great defensive roster. Mm -hmm. um, but Justin uh, J or Jalen Brunson, excuse me, was kind of the highlight of the off season in a way for Dallas. And he ends up going to New York for a four year, $104 million deal. Um, mm -hmm. Where did you kind of side with with that evaluation and um, the entire situation that played out with him going to New York? Yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy because for months and months and months, it was like, he's not going anywhere. There's just, there's no chance. And then you make it to the Western Conference Finals with, you know, a little bit of luck involved. Let's Let's call it what it is. And you make it there. And it's like, okay, well, then let's run it back. We'll try and make some additions. They get Christian Wood. And then it seems like, okay, all we got to do is re-sign Jalen Brunson. That's We've had a solid offseason. Call it a day. And then things just very quickly fall apart. And so it was difficult because a lot of people were, oh, well, I'm not paying him 25 plus or I'm not paying him five years. There were a lot of Mavs fans that were on board with, well, you have to pay him because you can't lose him. And then other people who were like, that's way too much money. And so it was, 
it kind of ended up seeming like, well, the front office seems to think that's just too much money and we're not willing to roll that out. And so personally, I thought that they should have paid him whatever because they just don't have, they're trying so hard to get Luca this clear number two for him to finally get over the hump. But when you don't have Jalen Brunson and now you don't have any young, you know, impressive players that you might try to build a package around that puts you in it just it just it makes it that much more challenging than it already was they they have never had like one of the best potential packages to put together for anyone that comes available but having Jalen Brunson even though he would have been making 20 25 whatever it would have been that would have helped you put together a package and so I was disappointed in them not putting up the money or even showing the commitment going into the offseason to I was disappointed that it even got to a position where it could fall apart. That should have never, ever happened. And so I think everyone looking at it is saying like, yeah, you guys messed up. You messed up big and now you're going to have to recover. But um, I do think, you know, Nico Harrison, since he's gotten here, I do think he he deserves some credit. He's made a lot of solid uh, moves. And so I think people have faith that he can, you know, get get them that final piece at some point. I don't think it'll be this this season, but I think after after this season is when they'll really look to kind of go all in. Yeah, I definitely thought from the outside that Brunson should have gotten paid. I mean, to average 16 and 5 and and be younger and still have that defensive impact. There's actually a clip of Davion Mitchell talking about how Jalen Brunson was the most difficult guy for him to guard last year, wow. which was a little out of left field to me, but uh just speaks to how impressive Brunson has been kind of with this change of pace and you know, Nova guys and their and their fundamentals. Um so True. I I think that it is there yeah, I mean, is there any two ways about losing Brunson? Is it just like a pretty big step back for the team next year? Is there comfort in like Dinwiddie taking a bigger role or, mm-hmm. or where do you kind of go from there? Yeah, it, it, it's hard because you're looking at it and you're like, okay, you lose Jalen Brunson and you really, most people are like, well, you made no additions. You did nothing. But the reality is bringing Christian, and, and I know this for any Mavs fans that hear this, I'm sorry, but getting Christian Wood, bringing him in the offensive impact that he's going to have. He hasn't really played with many solid point guards in his, in his time. So I think that he's going to get um, good opportunity, especially playing in a contract year to really step up um, and have that solid offensive role. I think Spencer Dinwiddie, like you, like you mentioned, they do expect and anticipate him being able to rise to the challenge, take on a bigger role, Um, I expect, I don't know if on night one, he'll be in the starting lineup, but I expect him to be in the starting lineup for the majority of the season, um, and definitely be in the closing lineup. Um, and so I think between Spencer stepping up, getting Christian Wood and getting Tim Hardaway Jr. back, they will be able to replace the offensive production that he brought to the table. Um, but they are pretty thin at the, at the guard position in terms of depth and and drafting Jaden Hardy obviously helps. And this, this, uh, coaching staff is, unlike the previous one seems to have a much larger emphasis on giving young guys their opportunity and so that they can build confidence and consistency and, and, and build upon that. Um, so I think Jaden Hardy, I mean, he's a confident, excited young kid who just wants to learn and, and be good for his team. And he seems excited to be here. So I think having him um, and then seeing if they might try and make one final move uh, or make an, uh, kind of a, a late free agent signing for to bring in uh, another veteran offensive oriented point guard who's proven that, you know, he can play in multiple systems. There are still a bunch of guys out there or a handful of guys, I should say, that that can do that. Um, a, a few that come to mind. I think Kemba, there's a previously established relationship there. So go it well. The Kemba situation is a little complicated, but Kemba, DJ Augustine, um, Isaiah Thomas, even, which I think some Mavs fans might just be pulling their hair out with that, but that's just how Dallas operates. They like the older veteran point guards that can play in different systems. And so that's what I anticipate happening, but we'll see how it shakes out. Yeah, real quick on on Jaden Hardy. I think it's funny mm-hmm. sitting from Sacramento's point of view. Um, anybody unaware, the Kings traded their second round pick to Dallas four future seconds and, and kind of just let Hardy go there. And of course, last guy in the green room. And I think it was just sort of picture perfect Kings in a way, the fact that we got to <laughs> go see him walk up there and put a Kings hat on with the logo behind him <laughs> and everything. And then now we're sitting here talking about uh, Quinn Cook or Matthew Delvadova for the third string point guard. And I mm-hmm. would love for that to be 
Jaden Hardy. And he, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was really bad with the Ignite, to be fair, but he's looked mm -hmm. good in summer league, a sh extremely young player. Um, so I, I don't think relying on him at all is is in the cards or anything this year. But right. the future potential is, is definitely intriguing there. Um, and, and you mentioned Christian Wood kind of being the other big addition. And he's in a contract year. He has 14.3 million remaining this year. The trade for him was uh, Boban, Trey Burke, uh, Marquise Chris, Sterling Brown in the 26th pick, which ended up being Wendell Carter, um, which then got rerouted to Minnesota, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, yeah, what do you expect of Christian Wood? I, I think that um, you pointed out he hasn't really played with very many, if any, to be honest, uh, quality players really high quality point guards throughout mm -hmm. the course of his career. He's been on some really tough rosters. Um, but what are you expecting from him? And like, what is he a four? Is he a five? <laughs> I, in my opinion, he has to be a four with Dallas um, because defensively, I think they're it's a little lackluster uh, to put it, I guess, politely. Um, and I think that's why they had to go out and make the JaVale McGee signing. And, and it, Based on what they've said, it looks like they do want to see what a lineup of JaVel McGee and Christian Wood in the front court looks like. Personally, I don't like that one bit, but the reality is the roster is what it is. And so you're going to have to make something work with what you've got. But um, I do think Christian Wood is more of a four than a five, but I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up playing a lot of five minutes next to Dorian, Maxi kind of and and going that route with it I think that that could be that's probably their best option talent wise um but as far as what I expect from him I don't necessarily expect him to be the number two option uh creating his his own shot I don't I don't want to you know necessarily expect that or put that sort of pressure on uh, the system him whatever but what I do expect is for him to um maximize on the opportunity uh, that comes with playing with someone like Luca. And just knowing the gravity that Luca is going to draw, there are going to be so many open uh, th pick and pop threes, late rolls, just catching the little dump off from Luca. I mean, there are going to be so many opportunities from him. Um, I'll be interested to see if they even try and really use him as a pick and roll lob threat. I think that they could, but I also think that they might try to do what they did with Dwight Powell in terms of, well, Dwight Powell was kind of the, the lob threat, but in terms of allowing him to pop, allowing him to kind of read the situation and, and hesitate on the role um, and just kind of let him do his thing. But for him specifically, when and, and any player really that comes and plays in Dallas, the Mavs are so heavily reliant upon the three-point shot. I do think that naturally he is going to get a little bit better as a shooter, uh, and I think the volume is even going to go up a little bit. So um, I'm hoping, my, my hope is that he's um, he brings a lot of points to the table that we were, we're going to miss from Brunson and kind of fills that gap. Um, and I'm hoping that he buys into the system as much as Mavs fans and Mavs ownership wants him to. Yeah, totally. There's a lot of potential there. You know, he's, I think about uh, 10 days away, 11 days away, according to basketball reference from 27. Um, he's a guy that can put up 20 and 10 and, and that's not like ridiculous expectations on pretty good shooting numbers as well. And, and nice versatility. Like I think as a pick and roll or pick and pop threat, um, with Luca, that two man game should be pretty intriguing. Um, JaVale McGee is a uh, interesting <laughs> one to me. Also, they signed him three years, 17 million. And in trying to figure out the depth chart here, um, I know that correct me if I'm wrong. They did tell JaVale McGee he was going to be starting, right? <sighs> yes. They did. Okay. <laughs> so what is this starting lineup? I had guessed uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Luka Doncic, Dorian Finney-Smith, um, and then I guess Christian Wood, JaVale McGee. So that is what it seems. There have also been some like rumblings, and I don't want to – I'm not going to say that this is what they said, This is, but I've heard that there are rumblings that Christian Wood might not even start. And that, and to me, that is uh, that is crazy. I don't see that happening. I just, it makes no sense to me. So at that point, I do think, here's what I'm going back and forth. Is it, are you starting Dinwiddie to have the secondary playmaker or are you starting Reggie Bullock because he earned it last year in the playoffs? Um, and I think that they have to start Dinwiddie just because of um, the secondary ball handler need. But I'm rolling with right now the assumption that Christian Wood and JaVel McGee are the starting front court 
And so it's between who 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 else is filling the gaps. Is it going to be Dorian Finney Smith and 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 Reggie Bullock, or is it going to be Dorian Finney Smith and um, Spencer Dinwiddie? And I, I I don't hate the lineup, but obvious there's obvious room for improvement there. And so um, we'll see what they do at <laughs> uh, at training camp. I'm I'm very I'm very interested to see the. Um, the the five on five scrimmages and to see who's wearing what jersey, what lineups they they seem to be running with a lot, um, and hopefully get some answers there. Because personally, I just even though Christian Wood is not the best defensive guy, I would much rather have him playing next to Dorian or even Maxi than having Javale and Christian Wood in the starting lineup. And yeah, I just it makes my head it makes my head hurt. No, uh, understandable. And and at very least, I, I think that Reggie Bullock, Dorian Finney-Smith, two really, really good 3 and D players, specifically Dorian Finney-Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Bullock is really impressive there as well. I think those two guys that Sacramento would kill to have. Um, and you mentioned Maxi. That's somebody that we've kind of messaged back and forth a little bit about yes. before, but he did just get this three-year, $33 million extension. Um, for people that are unfamiliar with Maxi, which I think I qualify in this, <laughs> Um, 30 years old. And I think you've kind of pointed out a little bit, a little bit of like a three and D four. Do you feel like that's a fair? He's one of the few. He is one of the few that is a a three. And that's how I think a lot of Mavs fans like to, to kind of uh, categorize him that way for sure. Um, And is that rim protection? Is that switching on defense? Like where is that on the defensive end? It's, it's much more on the perimeter defense. He can get out there and I mean, he can guard, he he's solid. And so there were, there were, I mean, people forget that in those two series against the Clippers back to back years, um, Maxi was the one that was picking up Kawhi a lot of times. And that was their, I mean, they had Dorian on Paul George and they had Maxi on Kawhi and that seemed to be working for them. Obviously you can't exactly shut down Kawhi, but for Maxi to be the one getting that, that, um, that challenge was, was a big deal. So I think in terms of there's the perimeter defense, but he, he has this um, underrated athleticism that allows him to recover and kind of be more of a chase down rim protector more so than just a, you know, vertical rim protector, if that, if that makes sense, but he's definitely sneaky in that way that a lot of people just don't realize. Yeah. And and does that extension kind of keep him in Dallas for, for a good while here in your mind? Oh, that's a great question, Brendan. Um, I, I think it does. I think it does. Um, there's obviously the Warsburg Germany connection between him and Dirk. Um, there's the undrafted. He's playing really well here. Same story as Dorian Finney Smith that I know that they love to just hang their hat on. Um, but in my mind, if you're going to make a trade that could potentially move the needle, Maxi is one of the ones that will have to be moved. And I think for them getting him at three for, for 33 or um, that is a very, that will allow them that, that option if they, if they choose to, to go it or to pursue it, I should say. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get to uh, potential trades later uh, as I've done with everyone, but I think Dallas for sure makes a lot of sense. Um, where does Davis Bertans and Dwight Powell fit into this? Because the they, front court is loaded. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they fit nowhere. I don't see a role for either of them. Uh, I think for Bertans uh, specifically, I, I would imagine it would be similar to last year where every now and then he gets tossed in there when they're trying to get a couple of quick buckets. Um, but I don't think he'll have a consistent role. And bringing in JaVel McGee, he's just more, I don't, I, I, I hate to even use the term elite, but he's a more elite rim runner than Dwight Powell is. Uh, in terms of size and just the athleticism. And so I think that Luca having someone that's over seven feet tall to throw lobs to that has that athleticism, um, that will prove to be good for, for the Mavs or for the team and for Luca. Um, But for Dwight Powell, I just don't really know where that leaves him. He's another guy that I just don't think will get consistent minutes. Maybe he gets in from night to night, but I can't see it being more than 10 minutes, maybe 12 at the, very max. Um, And that's very hard for me to see because they had a lot of success last year playing small and and with certain lineups that had Dorian Finney Smith at the five and Reggie Bullock at the four. Um, So I could see them going small again, some lineups. And and I think the primary big man rotation will be um, uh, 
shared between JaVale McGee, Christian Wood, and, and Maxi. Um, and, and there were even times last year where they tried to have Josh Green play at the four in a, a Bruce Brown-esque role. So I think that they could even try that again. Uh, and I hope that they do because with, with Josh specifically, I think finding ways to get him in there is, is going to do wonders for his game long term. Yeah, uh, Josh Green is is an interesting player to me. I, you know, about to be 22, um, or at least a couple months away from being 22. He shot 35, 36 percent from three last year, but that's on just under 80 total attempts. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, there's always been the defensive impact that he makes, and he's got a good strength for his size and a wingspan as well. But um, do you feel like it's fair to put expectations on Josh Green uh, going into his third year here? I do personally, because there, in my, in my opinion, last year, my answer would have been different because under Rick Carlisle, he just never really saw the floor. And then when coach kid came in, he was asked about what's your, what are your thoughts on giving these young guys opportunity to try and, you know, build the consistency that I was talking about earlier. And he said that that was a big part of what they're trying to work on. And a big reason why they brought in guys like Jared Dudley and coach Sweeney um, to, to help try and even Christy Tolliver to come in and try and, and, and help, uh, around these young guys out. And so for Josh specifically, he said earlier this off season, you know, I'm not going into off seasons working on things that I'm not going to be doing in a game. I know that the number one thing for me right now is to get consistent from the three. And once I do that, there's no reason why I shouldn't be. And then he, he also, he also talked about how he got benched in the playoffs and how it sucked, but he knew he understood why. And so um, I really like his mentality. He's a guy that just works hard. He's a good team team guy, great personality. Um, and he he's another guy that I, I wouldn't consider him a ball handler, but he has very good playmaking vision and and his ability to like execute these mid air passes are it's wild. And so um, I definitely think that there's a place for him on this team. There were there were several times last year where he kind of mirrored uh, Reggie Bullock's minutes. So when Reggie who would play like 40 minutes a night needed a break. It was Josh that would come in and replace him. Um, and so we don't have anybody on this team that has the athleticism that Josh Green has. And so if he can just get consistency and, and just from his, sh from a shot mechanics perspective, I think giving him two at like two attempts per night, because he's going to get them in this system. Um, and if he continues to bring the defensive energy, which is something that he's always done. Um, I absolutely think there's a spot for him and he will, even increase his value uh, as an asset on this roster because unfortunately a lot of Mavs fans don't see him that way, but I see otherwise. I see the vision. I was a big believer at the time of the draft. The playmaking you mentioned, um, the athleticism is crazy. It is. It's crazy. Um, so if he can hit that shot and, and kind of become a rotational player, I would think that it could be pretty valuable for Dallas this next season. Mm -hmm. And then is there any other – uh, you know, end of rotation guys that stand out to you that you're maybe optimistic that in spot minutes could could get could be decent contributors like a Theo Pinson or if you want mm -hmm. to throw Frank, Frank Nielakina, any of the exhibit tens they have, which I think is like Tyler Hall, McKinley Wright or mm -hmm. Tyler Dorsey on their two way. Like, is there anybody at the end of the roster that stands out to you as someone you really like? Uh, definitely Frank. Frank another great personality, great mindset for someone that understands their role, understands that they're not always going to get consistent minutes, but when they do is ready to go and, and has proven that with the focus and the defensive in intensity. And also by coming in um, and maybe not seeing the floor in like three or four games coming in and being able to knock down a catch and shoot three, that is something that a not many guys can do. And so for him, his, his um, just, ability to stay the course and stay focused is something that I know that Dallas really appreciates. And when you have offensive oriented guards like Luca Spencer and even Jaden Hardy, having someone like Frank is a necessity. You absolutely need that. And he proved his worth last year, specifically in the Phoenix sun series when they were down Oh two and they needed to switch something up, brought Frank into the lineup, put him on Chris Paul and just tried throwing different things at, at them. Um, and it worked. And so, um, Frank gets a lot of credit for that. And I know he got a lot of credit from the coaching staff. So I look forward to him um, continuing to build on, on last year. And um, a big, I guess a big change as time went on with him is he looked willing and confident to shoot these open catch and shoot threes, which wasn't really something that he did 
a ton of in New York. Um, and so seeing him do that, especially when he's playing off of Luca and he's not the primary ball handler has been really huge for them because like I said, trying to establish this defensive identity, the one that they did last year, Frank, despite not having a significant role minutes wise, had a big part in um, helping build that kind of defensive uh, culture. Makes sense. There's a lot of Frankie Smoke fans out yes. there that still yes. remain. Um, where are you at with, as the roster currently constructed, what is your expectation for how far the team could go next year? Because, you know, you mentioned it, like I, I do think the Western Conference race maybe had a little bit of luck involved. And yes. I think teams can fall into like, we were just in the Western Conference. We're not that far away. And then Brunson goes. I think Boston is in a weird situation that's somewhat comparable. Like they went all the way to the final, sure. But um, if you talk about all the injuries that Miami had, Milwaukee not having Chris Middleton, they might not be as close as like just the, we went to game six of the NBA final sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what do you think the sort of range for Dallas's potential regular season outcomes is next year? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad you you mentioned the word range because while you know injuries obviously have a lot to do with it, um, Christian Wood has a lot to there's there's questions there. But I think for Dallas, I mean, I can see that because they have someone like Luca, who I believe top five in the NBA, um, top seven, whatever you want to categorize it top as. Five. Top five. Top five. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So because he's top five, you can't you can't just like count him out. But I do think that they take a significant step back in terms of really more so about the uh, because of the Western Conference and how they many teams took steps forward and are come back, coming back healthy. For Dallas, I don't think that they took too much of a step backwards losing Brunson, considering the guys that they're getting back that we talked about earlier. Um, but I think ceiling wise in my mind ceiling finishing in the standings I think is the fourth seed I can't see them getting higher than that and I think fourth is even quite optimistic if you're really looking at teams like Denver Golden State um, the Clippers even Minnesota who I believe is going to do really well in the regular season um, and so for Dallas I do think that they could be in a bit of a rude in for a rude awakening um, this year. But I also think that there are now starting to become paths for them to put something together to take, to make a move that could really launch them uh, into that upper echelon in the Western conference. And, and like I mentioned before, I don't think it'll be this year. I think this year will be a little tough, but you know, it, I don't know. That's just a part of the process and you gotta, you gotta make that move that takes you that step forward and they just haven't done it yet. Could you see Luca winning an MVP next year? No. No. The no, other guys I hate, at the top I, are just too much. The problem is that for years now, he's had MVP caliber numbers, like efficiency, assists, rebound. Like it's all there. But the problem is the record. And until the record is there, I mean, they finished fourth last year. And for a while, they had the same or a, a better record than Philly. And near the same record as Milwaukee, but nobody was talking about Luca for MVP. And that's just the reality that they find themselves in. So until they get that number two, that puts them in to the top four, like pretty much guaranteed. Uh, nobody's going to give him that nod. I don't think. That makes sense. I'm proud of myself for going 28, almost 30 minutes without thinking, damn, the Kings really should have picked this guy. <laughs> um, I, I, I made it this far. It didn't pop into my head once, but of course it does eventually. Um, yes. Are, are you expecting the Mavs to be active in the trade market this, this coming season? And if so, like what positions do you think that they'd be uh, looking for? Yeah, I, I definitely expect them to be active. Do I think that it's guaranteed that they'll do something? No, because right now they're so... Um, let me start by saying the Christian Wood trade, not just bringing him in, but the guys that they moved out of were all non-rotational players. And so every single one of them. And so for me, that was a big win because there were times last year where certain guys would get subbed into the game and I would just be like, oh God, Lord help Very me. Very relatable. Very Lord relatable. help me for the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, now there's not a there's not a person on the roster who I'd be upset with them getting in the game. And so I feel very good about that. At the same time, 
like we were talking about earlier, there are very clear positions that could use uh, either an upgrade or just more depth. And so from that regard, I do think that they'll be in the market for another guard. Um, and if not a guard, a wing. And so um, I think a, a scoring wing is definitely something that they could look to add and would go a long way for them, especially as they try and continue to have a rounded out playoff ready um, roster, because right now they've got, they have depth, but they don't have many guys who can create their own shot. And so I think that that's a big marker for them to try and attack. And the only reason I don't think it's guaranteed that they get a trade done is because they're going to be very conservative with how they use a first round pick. And I think it's, it would take a lot for them to, to be willing to move off of one. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Is this where Harrison Barnes comes into a conversation? I don't I know about it, the I think it might be. But... Well, yeah, oh, believe me, we, we, fair enough, fair we enough. remember, we remember, um, <laughs> but the thing about Harrison is it's a completely different system for us now. And so considering what we got in return back in the day, <laughs> now you got to just forget that. And if he is available and Sacramento is coming from the position of, you know, we don't want to lose him for nothing. I think that is really the only scenario in which. Dallas could be the one that that lands him but Harrison Barnes for from where I'm standing for years now has been one of the most sought after trade assets and the Kings again from where I'm standing it looks like they just either haven't been satisfied enough with the offers or know that there will come a time where they can get even more and so um, I do think that that this will be the year he gets moved but I don't know if it will be Dallas because I don't know that they'll be able to meet the price. Yeah, it is a little tough to figure out and something we've talked about a, a little bit before. Um, I guess from this doesn't matter that much, I, I, but I'm curious, like, where does the fan base lie on HB? Is, is there like a willingness to bring him back or is there a sour taste after what happened? Oh, no. Uh, if anything, there's a sour taste directed at Mark Cuban for trading him in the middle of a game. Um, Mavs fans love well one they love former players they're always for bringing former players back but Harrison Barnes was a guy that the same as he's doing in Sacramento was heavily involved in the community uh, a good leader a good veteran locker room presence everything that you would want um so they would love to have him back fans would love to have him back I think just about every single person would um but like I said I just, there are, it's hard because I'm like, you've got other contenders that can probably offer more or, or the wizards I think are, are a team that could, could really try and, and get something done there. Um, but Dallas would love to have him back. I think he's exactly what they need. Um, but I would, I just don't, uh, it kills me. I don't know if the fact that they know exactly what they're getting in terms of him already having been a part of this franchise franchise, if that would push their willingness into being willing to part with a first round pick for him. Uh, because as of right now, I don't think that they would be. And that's, that's why I don't think they'll get him, which breaks my heart. Cause they, I, I think he'd be perfect. Yeah. It makes sense. I, I guess it's hard for anybody to not like Harrison Barnes. He's a very, very likable hard. person and, and player. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that definitely does make sense. And from Sacramento's point of view, it's, a little tricky to me because I definitely would it'd be so frustrating to me if he ended up walking at the end of the year for nothing after what feels like three years of all this talk about him being on the market and, and being highly sought after there was just some whispers about um, Phoenix having been interested um, can't help but wonder if that's like Camp Johnson you're talking about which feels like maybe not um, but there was previously Boston mm -hmm. that I think uh, ended up being two of Aaron Neesmith, Peyton Pritchard, and Romeo Lankford, any of their the two that they wanted there in a first-round pick, which I think ended up being 17 in Alper and Shen Goon that mm -hmm. uh, eventually went to Houston. But there's just been a handful of times where it's like, okay, there's a decent package on the table for HB, but the Kings decide to not do it. And right. I think where it's weird is that like if they're at the deadline, and I – Again, I'd be really frustrated if he ended up walking for nothing, but this is a team that is like trying to win right now. Right. Very much so. No two ways about it. And if I, I just don't see how they're trading Harrison Barnes and getting slightly worse in the immediate for the sake of, you know, like if we wanted to say uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., which I don't love this, for example, but I, I think right. that 
um, this is kind of fits the example of sorts where you'd have two more years of a player, but yes. you're taking a step back in the immediate in my mind. Like, mm -hmm. I think that makes sense in asset management, but I also just really struggle to see Sacramento pulling the plug on that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard, especially when your team that, that does have to take into consideration something like that, where you're operating under, okay, well, we can get a guy that's under contract for this many more years when at face value around the league, Harrison Barnes has greater value than someone like Tim Hardaway Jr. But when you have to take those things into consideration, that's where it can get a little bit tricky. And that's, that is why I do wonder um, if, how that situation is going to shake out because if he does get moved, it's hard for me to see teams putting up, like offering a premium package if they're sitting there saying, well, why would I do that? I I'll hedge my bets and, and bank on him walking, especially if I have the cap space to do it. And I mean, I just watched it happen with Jalen Brunson, which is terrible. Um, and so <laughs> I, I, I know, I know the feeling. And so that's why I'm wondering how Sacramento and what the kind of feeling around the situation is as Christmas comes and goes, the new year begins and February is right around the corner. Are they in a position where it's like, Hey, we're building some momentum. They've, they do have a deep roster. They've got young talent. They've got veteran experience. They've, they've got guys. And so can they put something together or do they see it as, okay, well, we don't want to lose him for nothing. I'm thinking long term here. And and I just I don't know. I that that you're I mean, I have no idea. Yeah. What do you think a package, an offer package would look like? Um, you know, I, I think that we've debated before like the idea of two second round picks or a first rounder, but when it comes to matching salary, mm -hmm. like I, I we mentioned Tim Hardaway Jr. I don't know that he'd have to have like a pretty big beginning of the year. Yeah, um and sure. I think show that he recovered from that foot injury pretty well. But mm -hmm. then after that, like, I don't think there'd be any interest in Devise Bertans. Um, I'm assuming from Dallas's side that Dorian Finney-Smith isn't part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it's like, I guess we're getting to Reggie Bullock or like a Maxi Kleba. Are mm -hmm. those kind of the two matching salary guys that you would have in mind? In my opinion, it would either be the package would either be Tim Hardaway Jr. by himself or... Well, I guess a little hairy with um, with the extension that just happened. But in my mind, the other option would have been Dwight and Maxi since they were both on expiring deals. Um, and then two seconds, either way, two seconds on top of either of those guys is what, in my mind, would make the most sense coming from Dallas. Again, I don't know that that's enough for Sacramento. And I think that they could get a better package elsewhere. Um, but as far as Dallas goes, um, especially if they're moving one of Maxi or Tim for them, those are big minute role players and a big part of what the group has been like the internal value on them. What I'm trying to say is, is high. And so um, Maxi in particular. And so for them, I can't see them attaching a first on top of that. Um, and I just don't know if that gets it done because the Maxi Dwight route is just, they don't need those guys. You know what I mean? Right. And so, especially with the extension, the whole, the whole potential and I guess appeal to that was that you had two guys on expiring deals, um, which is why I think the Tim Hardaway Jr. conversation could make more sense. Um, but I think a lot, like you said, hinders on how does he come back? How does he look out of the gates? Is he New York Tim Hardaway Jr. or is he Dallas Tim Hardaway Jr.? Because those are, those are different players. So um, I hope that, you know, he looks like he looks the way I want him to look, but you just never know. Definitely. I, I do think that Maxi, and again, I, I probably should be more brushed up on this. I, I don't fully understand off the top of my head, the complications that come with him having just signed that extension and when mm -hmm. he could be moved on from, but I would think mm -hmm. by the deadline that that, could, the deadline. that yeah. could happen. Um, and I, I think that that's somebody that could be really interesting to Sacramento, you know, a, a three and D four to put alongside Sabonis, I think is something that they really need. And it depends how they feel about Keegan Murray is Keegan Murray a three or, or does he need to play the four, right. which I don't know that there's all too much of a difference. Um, but I, I think that that's kind of what that depends on there. And I tend to think the same that they could get a better package. But in the process of doing all this, until I see what that better package is, I am pretty intrigued by Maxi Kleba as like okay. a primary return and two second rounders. Um, 
I, I'm really intrigued by by Kleba. I think a three and D four is is something that could be really beneficial to Sacramento. Yeah, they. I mean, those guys are very. You don't see very many of them, and it's for a while. I was like, okay, yeah, like we've got don't this, see any of them. Yeah, like you, you've got this guy. He can pick and pop. That's great. But then every now and then, like he comes in and he just on some like pick and rolls on some um, like. He just he does things that you're like, where where did that come from? Like where where did that come from? And so he just I don't know. He's just worked his way into like I said, the internal value on that man is, which is why I'm like, will they ever trade him? Because they you know I don't know I don't know. But in my opinion, if you're Nico Harrison and your number one job is oh I came in to take this team to the next level to be able to compete for a championship, you have to make those, those tough decisions. And for someone like Harrison Barnes, who offensively gives you more than someone like Maxi would, um, you've got to be willing to, to make a tough decision uh, because for Dallas, again, you can go out and get a defensive oriented wing, super athletic guy who just gives it his all on defense. If you, if that's what you need to do, but if there's a trade available and you have the salary to match and, and it fits the other team, you have to be able to pull that trigger. And um, in the previous regime, that was something that was like, they just can never pull the trigger. They can never part with these guys that have been around for forever. And now it doesn't necessarily seem like that is the same. I think Mark kind of Mark likes to hold on to some guys, but I think, I think Nico is like, I am here to, get this job done. And I think he will. Well, I hope he will. I I'm optimistic. I don't want to say he will, but I'm optimistic. Yeah. And HB for what it's worth. I think like this is a little bit of a point of contention, I guess with the fan base, he's been horrible on defense these last two years. Mm -hmm. Um, Like legitimately horrible. It's been really, really bad, but I tend to think like that's an engagement thing. And I think when you're seeing HB not be engaged, that spoke to some really bigger problems when it came to the locker room and coaching staff. So I think that's kind of the big swing on for just to see how he performs at the beginning portion of this year and could really change his value going into um, a trade deadline. And then Rashawn Holmes is the other guy I pitched to everybody. He's been linked Mm -hmm. to Dallas so often, Mm -hmm. but as we kind of laid out, this front core is is packed. Like, do you think that there'd be interest in Rashawn Holmes? I do for sure, because Rashawn Holmes contract, in my opinion, is outstanding. When I saw that that's that they got him for that, I was I was actually in the middle of a podcast and I was livid. I was like, Dallas, what are you doing? Like, oh, I was so angry. Um, So I I, I think he would, unlike Dwight Powell, because he does a lot of things similar to Dwight, but defensively in the past, there have been times where he, he just, he's very energized in the way that Dwight, I just think he's a better version of Dwight Powell is what I think. Um, and so um, I do think that there would be a spot for him in this system, especially if they did try to expand the package a little bit, because if you're looking at a potential Harrison Barnes and Rashawn Holmes for Tim Maxi picks, I think that that is something that could work very well for both sides because for Dallas, you're replacing something, um, and you're, I mean, I, I just think it's something that, that makes a lot of sense on paper um, for both and not even just from a talent player, but I think situation wise, like in my, from the outside, it kind of looks like Harrison and Rashawn have run their course in, in, in Sacramento and Sacramento seems to be having this new core, this core that's like very intriguing um, and younger. And like, that seems to make more sense in my mind. And then for Dallas, it's like, well, if we want to make an immediate upgrade, what's the best way to do that? Okay. It's probably going to be Maxi and Tim because everyone else, either the contract is bad. We can't physically afford to lose them or they're just too young or whatever the case may be. And so for me, that is something that I am really looking at going as the trade deadline gets closer. Um, Just because for, in my mind for Sacramento, they have this core and then even bringing in Herder and, and Malik Monk, like, if they want to run with that, they can still make a trade that wouldn't necessarily derail everything that they're trying to put together this season. And and in my mind, that is one of those trades. Yeah, I think it's something that kind of four reasons we laid out. I, I think I wouldn't have a great feel for where I stand on that until we got a little bit of a sample specifically for for THJ to see how yeah. how he bounces back here. Um, Dallas doesn't have their 2023 first rounder, right? Nope. Next have it. 
So if there were a deal to be mm -hmm. had there with a first rounder, which is a big if, yes. um, it would have to be then that 2025 first rounder. It would. Mm -hmm. Which makes it a little bit, I, I don't know how to feel about that from Sacramento's point of view. I would guess that they'd just be flipping that anyways would be the idea. Um, uh -huh. But I don't see that having great value. I mean, a first rounder is a first rounder. I, I'm definitely right. not trying to scoff at it or anything like that. But <laughs> I, I think that there definitely is an intriguing package there that um, I, I will have a better feel for as I go through the rest of these episodes and see what some of the other offers look like. Like I yes. think on the Cleveland one, we were just talking about like Karis LeVert, which doesn't really do anything for me. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. And I guess Cleveland has like 20 million in cap space that happened throughout the course of this Donovan Mitchell deal. And uh, Justin Rowan was saying that HB is like his dream target. And I'm like, God, that makes so much sense. Um, so that terrifies me, to be honest. Yikes. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But the last thing I, I have for you, Lauren, uh, mm -hmm. that I'm closing out here with with the different people that I'm doing this with is what is your, and I, I know this can be difficult from, from the outside looking in, but I'm curious outsider's perspective of uh, this Sacramento roster and specifically the Fox and, and Sabonis pairing. Oh, it's a great question. Um, oh boy. Personally, I, I am a little nervous about it more so because Fox, it really comes down to Fox because so going into last year's trade deadline, when I heard, I think the first time I heard it was Jake Fisher had mentioned that Sabonis is the eye to keep or the name to keep an eye on for a potential surprise move. And I was like, what? I was so shocked by that because in my mind, I mean, the amount of times I've seen him play, he is a guy worth building around in my mind. I think he's that talented. Um, and so when he went to Sacramento, obviously for that, we don't need to rehash all that, but like, that's a pretty significant addition, especially when you already have someone like De'Aaron Fox and you already have Davion Mitchell, Tyrese, we don't need to get into that, but you do have this established duo that you're, that you're going to try and make work. And so, Personally, I didn't think that their games were super compatible, but you just, you never know. Sometimes things can change. You can change your style. We've seen that multiple times before. So personally, right now, I feel like there's just been too small of a sample size to see what they could look like and what their ceiling could be. But I don't really know that De'Aaron Fox has has necessarily had someone, like, a, like an established duo that has so much talent that could actually be competitive i don't think he's necessarily had that yet that's not a knock on tyrese tyrese was just very young and sabonis has more experience and so um i think when you have a new coaching staff you you still have someone like harrison barnes and even kevin herter who has playoff experience when you're putting all of these pieces together everything about the team starts to feel different it doesn't feel like a team that's like oh we're young we're just trying to figure it out and get everyone playing like you're you're you have the the pieces in place to establish an identity and to be competitive. And in the West, a couple injuries, you never know what can happen. And so um, I'm very intrigued by the Sacramento team. I really, really like Keegan Murray. And one thing that I am a big, like I put a big, I value it so highly is, is personality and how you carry yourself and how you just approach everything, not just the game, but everything. And the way Keegan Murray has ever since he got drafted, I mean, summer league MVP, the way he's carried him, he's excited to be there. That's not something that just grows on trees. And so I really like that aspect of bringing him into this young core um, and trying to continue to build around that. And so I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by them, um, but I do need to see a bigger sample size with Sabonis and Fox specifically to see how they play off of each other or if they're going to kind of just have independent games that do their own things and, and maybe can put up numbers, but don't necessarily work the best together. I need to see which one, which one it is. I'm shocked that it took this long to have somebody be a little bit skeptical of the Fox and Sabonis pair. Really? I think most people, yeah, most people really liked it. Um, I am with you. I, I think that there's definitely reason for optimism. I think like Fox playing off of a big that can pass like that and his obviously like a uh, full top speed is, is really impressive his first step. But I think like the jerkiness of his fakes and, and off ball movement with cutting, I think could work really well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, like you said, like a lot relies on, on Fox to improve. I think specifically that jumper. Yes. Um, as two guys that can't shoot. And if that's going to be a deadly two-man game, one of them has got to be a, a pretty good shooter. And I think that 
you have to rely on Fox to be that guy because Sabonis really just hasn't shown it much at all throughout the course of his career up to this point, which is totally fine. Does a lot of other great things really well. Um, The last thing I have for you, and Mm -hmm. I'm going to need a hard yes or no here for you. (laughs) Do not feel obligated to say yes, because this is a Kings podcast. Okay. Will the Sacramento Kings end their 16-year playoff drought? So not postseason. Postseason is a play-in game, right? But they'd have to win the play-in and be in okay. the playoffs. Do I think? I do. Th- oh Lord, it's so the hard West when I try to, the West. There, it's so when you actually start rattling off the number of teams, it's it really is so difficult. I think that I think so- that they can. I think that they can do it. I really do because um, I, yes, they have this duo, but bringing in shooters is huge because even if you don't have, even if Fox isn't shooting well, even if Sabonis and his work with the lethal shooter doesn't pay off, you've got these shooters and, and they're not just, they're not just, Oh, catch and shoot three guys. Like these are guys that can, and Malik Monk and Kevin Herter specifically that can get shots off quickly. And then like no space, very crowded, off, running off screens. And so um, I think that that's going to bode well for them. And and um, I'm intrigued again to see how it works, but I just don't think it's, I don't think that they are now in a position where it's, oh, if these guys don't do anything, well, we're never going to win. Or if one of these guys get gets hurt, you know, we're, we're done. Like I, I think you can have Davion potentially step up, Keegan potentially step up. And so I'm very intrigued by them, but the West is just, like there's still so many questions with the Lakers. God only knows what's going to happen there. But um, yeah, I mean, the Mavs are one injury away from just missing the whole thing. And so there's so many moving parts in this Western conference, but I think the Kings, my biggest thing with the Kings right now is that they're a lot deeper than people realize or want to give them credit for as of right now. Love to hear it, Lauren. I, I'm only, this is actually somehow only the sixth of these previews. I really got to pick up the pace here before we get through uh, preseason <laughs> and training camp and all that. But we're now at three yeses and three no's. So we'll split right down the middle, which I think is understandable um, because yeah. it's it's totally easy to look at the roster and it's like, oh, this is at least I think it'd be a really, really good offense. I have no clue what to expect on defense. That's just mm-hmm. a lot on Mike Brown to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just like, yeah, when you're looking at the rest of the West, it's like, they have to be better than one of Portland, LA, Portland, or the Lakers, pretty much. Which, which I, think is I don't. I think that's reasonable. I think it's reasonable. I I am not sold on the Lakers, definitely, but I also am not sold on Portland. I yeah. I even saw that somebody ranked them as having like ranked their off season in comparison to like some of these other teams, and they had them. I don't remember who they had them over, but I was like. I might be a hot take, but y'all are giving Jeremy Grant way too much credit in my mind. I'm sorry. I just, I'm not buying into it yet. So we'll see. Yeah, it will be interesting. And then I think once you get to the play in, like anything can happen when it comes to single elimination basketball games, absolutely. Anything can happen. Anyone can win on any given night. So um, that's all I have for you, Lauren. Is there any final thoughts you have or questions you want to throw my way or anything like that? Oh man, any final questions? Um, I abs- who in your mind, who do you think could give you the best package for Harrison Barnes and what does it look like if you have one? Yeah, I don't It's hard. That's I think, kind of a loaded question. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, in this process like I said I'm kind of trying to figure out what the different packages look like, but I, mm-hmm. I think that it is going to be something like a Tim Hardaway Jr., where a player looks really good but is on a longer term contract, yeah. where it's going to be a step back in the in the immediate, um, but for somebody that lasts a little bit longer contractually. Um, yeah. And and I'm kind of holding out hope that like it just became a thing this year that for some reason it feels like a lock that HB is going to walk. And oh really? Okay. I'm like holding out hope that if the team performs well could he stick around and i don't I don't, yeah. I don't know but i i think that it like should be talked about maybe a little bit more than it is yeah i mean um, i think he's one of the few that would like that are at the stage in their career where they would stay i think he's the type of guy that 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 would consider that yeah I'm trying to look through these <laughs> and I, I'm not the most confident. Clearly I'm trying to it's look hard. through these other teams and, and remember some of these previous packages. Um, I'm totally out of it today. 
Um, it's all... I'm I will, wondering I, if Portland might try to get in there. Yeah, like what, like a Norman or not Norman Powell anymore? It's like a it'd be like, like a Josh Robert Hart. Covington or something. Yeah, Josh like, Hart. I, I think that Josh that's Hart. intriguing. The whole yeah. issue here is that they get rid of HB. They need another HB. Like exactly. all of a sudden they have a hole at this position, True. and it just makes for a really tough th- uh, spot. Like I wouldn't be absolutely shocked if he just sticks it through the year and then whatever happens in in free agency. So. Mm-hmm. I think, but I think the standouts are things like a Tim Hardaway Jr. or a Karis LeVert, you know, and if one of these guys like has a good year that you could see that, that package being somewhat intriguing. Um, There was like a a Seth Curry. Is that somewhat intriguing, but positionally again, he's not as much of a three. Um, So I, I think that it's definitely a situation that I'm, hopefully going to get better answers for as I continue this series and I will get back to you. Yes, please do. Because I, that is something that I am keeping my eye on for sure. I will definitely keep you posted. Um, and anybody listening, that is Lauren gun, a co-host of the gunshot podcast. And that's at Lauren gun on Twitter. G U N N. Um, can't say thanks enough for joining me, Lauren. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And definitely everybody else also check out all the great work from myself and all the other guys and gals at the Kings Herald and take a look at their Patreon to support local independent Kings coverage. And if you enjoyed this episode of the Kings Pulse podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. And you hear from me again in the next couple of days.